So my wife and I have six wonderful children. One of them is here, Virginia. She's in the corner. Um, and I made the mistake in our first, with her first child, David, of trying to coach her through labor. I thought I was, you know, the helpful guy. And she quickly looked up and she said, shut up, please, I can do this. And that was the end of my coaching experience uh, in terms of um, that, that part of our marriage. But there, there are times when uh, coaching does involve um, family cleanup nights and stuff like that. But, but personal vocation coach, at the heart of it, is about helping each person understand and grow into and become the unique person that God has called them to be. So that's really the heart of what I'm called to do, both as a father and as a husband, and also as a, as a teacher and coach as well. So it's very, very good to be with you. It's delightful that we can be here together, and that we just had Mass together with the glorious singing and glorious worship. So that was such a delight to be with you there. I want to begin with a story. Can you all hear me well enough? If you can, give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. I want to begin with a story of Mother Teresa and a reporter. And it goes like this, and perhaps you've heard stories like this. So a reporter who probably had some affinity for um, numerical analysis with numbers asked her once, Mother, uh, here you are in the slums and there's hundreds of thousands of poor people around you. Does it bother you that you're making such little difference, really, in the lives of all these hundreds of thousands? You're not making much of a difference, Mother Teresa, are you? And she said, I'm not concerned about the masses. It's not a numbers game. I'm not concerned about the numbers. When I leave my convent and attend and see the person there in front of me, poor person perhaps, this is Jesus to me. And at that moment, he's all that matters. At that moment, he's all that matters because this one here is a unique and unrepeatable image bearer of Christ. And at that moment, this is who I'm called to love. That singular focus. I'm not concerned about the numbers. I'm concerned about the one. The one. So that story of Mother Teresa is instructive at many, many levels. But I want to use it to introduce the first of three different parts of what I'll be presenting to you today about. The first is this. Each person as created being is a unique and unrepeatable image bearer of Christ, and already a part of God's grand story. So at Mass a few minutes ago, as Father began to talk about how each of us are a part of God's story, I said, I love how the Holy Spirit works themes together, because that's a huge theme that we're going to talk about today. Every single person, by virtue of their creation, is a unique and unrepeatable image bearer of Jesus Christ. I'm going to return to that in a moment with Mother Teresa and the story of the reporter and her. The second thing I want to cover, though, is that each also has a personal vocation. And a very important point here is that we're not talking about state in life simply, but a unique call by name that includes our state in life and many other things as well. But it's a call by name. And that's a calling by name to co-create with God a book in the multi-volumed history of salvation, right? Part of the glory of being an image bearer is that each has a part to play, a work to do. We get the opportunity with Christ to participate with him in the building up of his kingdom. So that second point, each has a personal vocation. We're going to talk about what that means. Finally, your mentors are here to help you co-create your own personal vocation and respond to it more vigorously in the months and the year to come. Now, they're going to do that in part. They're going to do it in many, many ways, but in part through what we call fulfillment stories. And so in the third part of my presentation today, we're going to talk about that, what we mean by fulfillment stories. Essentially, it's a story of taking stock of what the Lord has already done in your life and the way that you express in a way that has never been given before in the history of time and never will again until the end of time. This unique expression of God, a facet of his glory. So those stories give a, give a glimpse of that. 
and your mentors are going to be working with you, along with a variety of other kinds of things as well, but they're going to be working with you in those fulfillment stories to help you see part of how you image the Lord and what that implies for your life going forward. Okay. So I want to go back to this first point, that each is a unique and unrepeatable image bearer of Christ and that you are already a part of God's story. Let's think about Mother Teresa. And if you haven't yet seen the, the glorious statue of Mother Teresa in the bottom floor of the basilica, you've got to see that because that, that statue gives evidence of what I'm about to talk uh, with you here about. So I expect you've seen the pictures of her. Maybe she's gazing at a picture of a child or she's gazing at a child and you've seen the picture. Maybe it's uh, an old person, a young person. But if you gaze at those pictures of Mother Teresa with, with singular persons, what you'll notice is this fixation on the face of the other. Right? The other thing that Father talked about in the homily that we, that we, that we heard about from St. Paul is that the glory of God is in the face of Christ. Right? And by the incarnation, by the fact that our Lord is the creative principle of all human persons, when we look at a, a person, we're also seeing the face of Christ. And so when Mother Teresa is looking at the baby or the old person or the poor person uh, who's diseased and hurting, it's a gaze at Jesus, the one who participates with Jesus. And it's the kind of gaze that I hope you all have received. It's the kind of gaze that we're lacking in this digitized, disconnected, hasty culture. But if you've had those moments, and I believe most of you had, I hope you have, you know that at those moments when you're being gazed at by, gazed at by a, a parent or a loved one or a mentor or a coach, that at that moment you're, you're the only one that matters. At that moment. And so that's the gaze of Mother Teresa for each unique and other repeatable person. I think it's important also to look at what this is not. Mother Teresa and others who look with love at the unique human person are not doing so because they're a mere symbol of Jesus, a representative of our Lord. And I think sometimes when we talk about seeing Jesus in the face of the poor, we have this idea that that, that poor person is a kind of shell or a mere representative. But that's not what's going on here. Because our Lord is the creative principle of all persons, all being, Right? That person is a unique word of Christ. So she's looking at Jesus, this Jesus. This Jesus. Not that Jesus, but this Jesus. So to see the person as sort of a, just a symbol or a shell of Christ is actually depersonalizing. And I think we can, we can question ourselves, how do we look at the other when we're considering the other as our neighbor in Christ. So Mother Teresa saw, and we ought to see, that this particular face of Jesus is every person. Right? Every person is a unique and unrepeatable image bearer. So each one is a particular word of God held up in existence by the word of God who shines to that person in a particular way. So my sisters, we're about receiving the gift that we are. You are here about receiving the gift that you are. And the first thing, the first foundational step is at the level of creation. We're going to get to the glory of baptism in a moment. But even at the level of creation, to truly receive the gift that we are and the gift that every person is, we have to recognize that he created us already, even before baptism, to be a unique image bearer. And that's profound. And if we fail to do this, if we fail to do this, I think we can fall into a risk of treating the unbaptized, for example, as just sort of the unwashed damned. Right? Those who have not yet participated in the life of Christ through baptism. And that's a major problem. And also considering ourselves and our own story that way as well. 
So we've got to begin at the level of creation when we talk about receiving the gift that we are. Because you are created by the word of God to be his image bearer. Now, emphasizing the glory of the person at the level of creation, it's not to undermine baptism at all, but to highlight it. The person, unlike the teaching of Martin Luther, is not a dunghill, right? Not just a lump of mud before the grace of baptism, but a diamond, an immortal diamond. The horror of sin and damnation which baptism evaporates is that persons created to shine in glory spend eternity in darkness. Now let's turn to who we are as members of the baptized. This is where we almost have sisters in unspeakable glory. And I want to dwell here for a little bit because I think that we have a kind of an anemic sense of baptism as Catholics. And we've got to stand on the reality of who we are as baptized members of the body of Christ. So our identity at baptism is radically changed. As beautiful as we are in creation, at baptism there is a radical and ontological change, a change in being. Let's listen to selections from St. Paul in the book of Galatians. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You are all one in Christ Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what he's not saying here is that he's just been absorbed into the Godhead, right? He's one with Christ, he's put on Christ, but he still uses the personal singular pronoun, I and me. So there's a vitality of uniqueness in the baptized, where St. Paul can say, right, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, but the Christ who lives in him is his Christ, the one who he was created to be in the Lord. Right? So there's still an I. This is Christian selfhood. But it's the I who participates as a member of the body of Christ. Now, in the glory of the Eastern Church, Eastern Catholic Church, our our, uh, separated brethren among the Eastern Orthodox, who are close to us, there is this wonderful, wonderful emphasis upon divinization. And I believe very much, particularly in this disconnected, anxious, difficult culture that we're in, where so often we see the Lord there, and we're just here trying to make our way through the valley of tears. We have to dwell on this reality, my sisters. We are partakers in the divine nature by baptism. We are partakers in the divine nature by baptism, let alone what we receive at confirmation let alone what we receive when we come from church after receiving the Holy Eucharist and the divine life is permeated into every fiber of our being. We are partakers of the divine nature. That's the gift that we are. And we have to speak, we have to act, we have to live in the full confidence that we are members of the body of Christ. There's nothing proud about that. Rather, it's a lack of humility if we neglect that truth and fail to stand in it. Now, notice the confidence of the saints as they talk about themselves. And this is the kind of confidence that Father spoke about as well. This full freedom in Christ. We're not fully ourselves unless we have this full freedom. Let's listen to what St. Paul says in Joan of Arc and the Little Flower. So in Philippians 4, think of the boldness of this. Think of of, of saying something like this yourself. He says in Philippians 4, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. So St. Paul, in the full confidence that he is a partaker of the divine nature, it's no longer I who live, the fallen man, he's gone. I live in Christ. And because of that, he speaks with boldness. 
do what I do. Do what I do, and you'll receive the peace of Christ. Think about the young 19-year-old Joan of Arc. It's amazing. She says, I'm the envoy of the King of Heaven. Can you imagine yourself saying that? <laughs> or, I am the drum on which God is beating out his message. Whew! Right? She says to the French troops battling English invaders, follow me and my banner, and we're going to win. Right? We're going to win. We're taking, taking them out. Right? So it's this 19-year-old girl, peasant girl, who's so aware that she has no strength in herself, but has all strength in Christ, and she can speak with boldness and confidence. Again, not as if she was absorbed in the Lord, because the Lord delights in taking a 19-year-old to whoop the English army. Right? And she knows it. The glory of St. Therese, the little flower. Think about this boldness. Because not only is she talking about who she is right, as, as, a, as a, uh, a person before she had gone to glory, she knew she was going to glory. So she says this, When I die, I will send down a shower of roses from the heavens. I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. Right? She's so fully confident that she is a partaker of the divine nature that she's telling us all, yeah, when I'm up there, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be showering down roses because that's what God wants from me. So notice that confidence. She's using the first person singular, I, but she knows she's a full partaker in the divine nature. And that's the kind of confidence that we have to have. This full confidence that Father spoke about at the end of the homily is, is standing so firmly in the reality of, of our baptismal graces the reality of the Eucharist, the, the reality of who we are as confirmed members of the body of Christ, that we walk in total confidence and boldness. Now notice also how bold they are about building his kingdom. They are aware that they are part of God's story in a powerful way. St. Therese, I'm so much a part of God's story that I'm going to spend having showering roses on the rest of the earth, those who ask of me, Right? So when we're, when we're aware of who we are in Christ, we're also aware that we're doing his work, and it's important work. And no one else has the work that I have. It's a special work. It's not been given to anybody else, and this is true of each one of you. God has put you for, on this earth to do a work that hasn't been given to anybody else in the history of time. What a glory that is. What a glory that is. So St. Paul is able to say that I'm one in Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we ought to be able to say, but it's uncomfortable. Listen to this. I am an altar Christus. I am another Christ. It's easy for us to say, oh, I see Jesus in my neighbor. How often do we say, I'm another Christ, by God's grace alone, and my saying yes, by his grace, gave me the grace to say yes, I am the face of Jesus. But this, the saints speak like that with, with boldness. Why can't we? We must to become and receive fully who we are. So if you whisper that to yourself, I am another Christ, I am the face of Jesus, it's a little squeamish, isn't it? <laughs> but it's true. So if humility is acknowledging who we are before God, then failure to declare that by baptism I am another Christ, that's a lack of humility. And we want to be humble, don't we? So receive the gift that you are. Receive the gift that you are, a unique image bearer of Christ by virtue of creation, a partaker of the divine nature by baptism, called to build up his kingdom in ways that have never been told before. 
right? To, 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 to share the story, to share your story that's never been told before. All right, let's talk now about personal vocation. And I, I wanted to anchor us in baptism because, of course, this call by name begins at creation, but at baptism we are made partakers of the divine nature in, in glorious ways. We're made priest, prophet, and king. We're really called, deeply we're called. We're a member of the body of Christ, intimately. So we've got to be grounded in baptism. Now, let's talk about what personal vocation means. Vocation is such a loaded term. It means so many different things. And I want to concentrate here because I do believe that we're still dealing with a problematic clericalism that Pope Francis talks about. And we've got to identify the full orb meaning of personal vocation and live in it. So what do we mean by it? I want to begin with a passage from St. John Paul II. This is from his very first letter to the church um, in uh, Redemptor Hominis. The popes, of course, have to have writing committees, right? When they're on their third encyclical, they've got to have writing committees. And that's just natural. But this one is deeply imbued with his personalism, right? And you can tell it's his, his own pen was used to write Christ the Redeemer of man. Listen carefully to what he says here. Because we're about renewal right now. The world's falling apart, but we're not, we're not worried about that. We're about renewal. And you all are a big part of that. So here's what he says. We must, however, always keep in mind the truth that every initiative serves true renewal in the church and helps to bring the authentic light that is Christ insofar as the initiative is based on adequate awareness of the individual Christian's vocation and of responsibility for this singular unique and unrepeatable grace by which each Christian in the community of the people of God builds up the body of Christ. For there to be true renewal, we have to make the person the way of the church. And that's a huge aspect of this encyclical. Each unique, unrepeatable person is the way of the church. So, the call by name, that's personal vocation. It's singular, unique, unrepeatable grace. And it includes all these other wonderful dimensions of vocation. When God calls us by name, he of course calls us to holiness. So there's this universal vocation to holiness that we all share. That's one dimension of, voc of vocation, right? The, the largest sense, let's say. We all share in that. So when he calls us by name, when he loves us and looks into us and gazes at us, of course he's calling us to holiness. Of course it also includes our state in life. This basic way that we give to ourselves to the Lord in relationship to others in the body of Christ, which often involves vows, of course, right? The state in life where we vow to a certain uh, commitment. Also profession, you think about vocation in terms of profession also. So there's multiple layers of meaning, but when we're called by name, it incorporates all those different aspects. The universal call to holiness, or state in life. So it holds the fullest meaning of vocation. It is, to paraphrase the words of St. John Paul II, this singular, unique, unrepeatable calling that God gives each Christian to build up the body of Christ. Now, I want to make two basic points here that are very, very important when we consider personal vocation. It's absolutely critical that we think about our state in life in terms of personal vocation. And here I want to be a bit critical, but critical for the sake of love. When we talk about vocation as if it's just a state in life, then we can make vocation about the state itself rather than the person. God calls persons. And so although our state in life is absolutely valuable and the state in life of, of uh, 
the priesthood and religious life is a glory that the church has always taught is at an objectively objective level a superior way of life right meaning that the one who takes on holy orders or takes the vows of, of sisterhood is closer to where we will all be at the end of time right a lot to talk about there but i want to i want to state that because it's church teaching and we sometimes don't state it but i also want to I want to state that because I'm, I'm also very critical of a clericalism in the church that emphasizes the priesthood and the state of life as vocation. For example, if I was to say to you, my son David, he's 21 years old, I think he has a vocation. You all would know exactly what I meant by that, right? So still in our common parlance, we tend to talk about vocation in terms of priesthood and religious life which is a glory. But when we talk about vocation as state in life, what that can do, not always, but it can underline the glory of our baptism. Imagine talking to a young person who's 12 years old, who's baptized, just been confirmed, and has just received the Holy Eucharist. That child is glowing with divine life is a member of the body of Christ, is a soldier in God's army, is called to be priest, prophet, and king by virtue of that, that baptism. And we say to the young person, maybe you have a vocation. What does that say about the glory of the sacraments that he's just received? Of course he has a vocation. So, when we ask ourselves, are we called? That's not the right question, my sisters. So the recruitment posters which say, are you called? I think should be replaced by this. You are called from the, from the moment of creation. Let's help you understand more fully what that is. And when every person is, is focused with this loving attentiveness, you are a unique image bearer. You are called. You've been called from all time. You've been given a guardian angel from the beginning of time just for your journey. You are called. Let's work together to figure out what that is. When that's the stance that we take as a church, then we will have vibrant responses to every state in life. Are you tracking with me? You understand what I mean by this? Right? I have to be a bit critical because I think that, that so many of our young people who are spiritually tepid they need to be encouraged that they are called, that they are unique image bearers. And when that's the, that's the focus, then there will be more responses to priesthood and religious life, which we do need desperately. There will be stronger marriages. But the focus here is that you are called by name. From the beginning of time, you're called by name. Another problem with focusing upon state and life is like this. I was once approached by two women after a talk. One of them might have been a widow, and the other one had been single for 50 or 60 years. And the basic story was this, that the woman who had lost her husband said, I don't think I have a vocation anymore. Because she's no longer married. So she was so used to thinking about her vocation as her state in life, that she was like, what am I supposed to do? I've lost my vocation. Right? And the single person said, there's such an emphasis upon marriage and priesthood and religious life that I don't think I've ever had a vocation. I'm still discerning it. That might be true as state in life. But when we recognize that we are called right now at this moment, that we're right now part of God's story, that yes, we have a personal vocation. And it may be that you've lost, sadly, your husband. It may be that you've wanted to be married, but you're not. But you have a personal vocation. And God wants you to live it right now, in the fullness of this time, right now. Another problem, I think, is this. And I think diocesan priests suffer in this way, as I've heard from them very directly. Sometimes we treat our priests like sacramental functionaries. Or we treat our sisters because they wear the habit as if they all must sing beautifully like they did not long ago. <laughs> right? 
or because they, they hold the habit, they must just be a certain way. So sometimes we, we miss the person because we're thinking about the state in life. And that's not what God wants. We want the glory of the priesthood or the glory of the religious life to, to be upheld. But there's a person who takes vows. There's a person who has ordained a priest. And we can't treat our dear sisters and priests and brothers in a depersonalized way. I think some of the dis- disassociation in the crisis of, of uh, sexual abuse has to do with the separation between sacramental function and personhood. Also, there's this. I don't know how many of you young persons are, are married, but every semester at Franciscan University, I get this story from my students because they're used to thinking about vocation as a state in life. When I talk to them about personal vocation, and they recognize that at that moment, they are called. And God wants them to live for him fully in that moment. They they may not have figured out their state in life. Of course, it's important to think carefully and dream and discern well, absolutely. But so often young people are thinking about, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Am I going to be married? Is it going to be this? I haven't figured out my vocation yet. But when we talk about our unique calling that God gives to us at every single moment right now, then it's, ah, there's a relief there. And every single semester I get this, oh, what, what a relief this is. I do have a vocation. It's right now. My personal vocation is right now. And so it can relieve anxiety and also can allow young people to live in the dignity and the responsibility of their calling in the present moment. And this leads me to my second major point. The first point is we've got to understand state in life in terms of our personal vocation. But the second point is this. Now is our personal vocation. It's right now. The wisdom of the saints over and over and over again instruct us to abandon ourselves to the sacrament of the present moment. The little flower speaks this way. Jacques Philippe speaks this way. Father Walter Chiswick speaks this way, right? De Cossade and Abandonment to Divine Providence speaks this way. Mother Teresa speaks this way. It is absolutely vital for us. And I think we can't have that full confidence that Father spoke about. I don't think we can have that full confidence unless we're fully living in the sacrament of the present moment, fully in the now. Because we're thinking about what's to come. We don't know, quite know what it is. We're a little worried about it. And maybe we have regret about the past or we're worried about the past. We're not sure what the Lord's going to do about the past. We have regret and shame. Full confidence is saying, hey, I have no idea what the Lord's going to do in the next five minutes. He may come again in glory. But what I do know right now is I'm supposed to be here. You're all there. The Lord's called you here. And I can say yes to him because the Holy Spirit is fully present here and and wants me to be fully present to him. So that's another thing about personal vocation and also another very critical thing for us to relieve the depression and the anxiety and the worry. My personal vocation is right now. And there's a lot of wonderful aspects of this. We know, for example, that God lives in the eternal now. Right? God's not one who, um, he holds all, pre- all things in the eternal now. Right? The past, the present, it's all one to him. He lives in that eternal now. So when we are confidently living in the sacrament of the present moment, we're more fully imaging him. He 
Here's another critical aspect. At this moment, you're seated at various tables. Some of you, unfortunately, are in breakout rooms, but it's, we're still together, praise God, in one building. We just had mass together. This moment that we're living at this very second is going to be a part of our heaven or our hell. If we fail to say yes to our baptismal graces and should fall and separate from, from God, this very moment is going to be part of our hell. Because you see, we are creatures that by God's grace are intended for all eternity. So when we get to heaven, praise God, we're all there together, right? It's not like our time on earth is going to be lopped off, right? Because we're, we're immortal creatures, every moment that we're given is a part of who we are in the eternal now of God. Are you tracking with me? If you do, raise your thumb, please, okay? So what that means is that our heaven includes this time. So when we're wandering around worried about what we're going to do, right? Worried about our past, worried about the future, we're kind of screwing it up a little bit, right? And, and in heaven we'll say, well, God redeemed that, but I kind of screwed it up. <laughs> but he still makes glory out of it. The point is this, every moment matters, my sisters. Every moment is permeated with divine grace. Every moment he calls us to say yes to him and be his unique image bearer right now. And that's a glory. It's, a, it's, it's an incredible glory. So we've got to dream our, our dreams. We've got to uh, plan for our future. We've got to discern well about possible direction. But We've got to live our personal vocation in this present moment. And it's not a passive exercise, right? On the contrary, we live in the now more fully when we're anchored in hope for the future and also grateful for the blessing that we've received in the past. Okay, I want to turn to my, the third part of this presentation. A powerful way to get grounded in who we are uniquely created to be and what our personal vocation is in the present moment and how to co-create with it, co-create uh, with the Lord our personal vocation, is to consider a certain kind of story. And we call those fulfillment stories. So I want to talk about those fulfillment stories and the opportunities that you're going to have to discuss them with your mentors. So I've got 21 minutes until the end of the hour. Is that correct? Okay. All right, good. So I want to have like 15 minutes of questions. So let's back up to the very beginning to talk about fulfillment stories. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, so I like to go metaphysical, okay? But I'm a practical philosopher, okay? So God creates through language. He's a storyteller from the very beginning. He brings things into being by speaking them. And his word, his logos, is the creative principle of all things. And he created in joy, exuberant joy, ecstatic, joy-filled love. So all things were made in this surge of joy-filled love. And then after creating them, he intended them all to return to him. The whole universe is a return back to the Father through the word. So it's this principle of Aristotelian and Thomistic metaphysics that every being in the universe is on a journey back to the Father. And every being wants to be itself. Every being has this natural desire to be itself, even the birds and the bees and the rocks, right? It wants to be its proper place in the universe. Now, another Thomistic principle, I'll pull these two together, is that action reveals essence. Action reveals essence. So the kind of action that we as persons are supposed to engage in, in our journey back to the Father, 
it's important to identify what that action is for us as persons. So we understand ourselves and others by authentic action. Action reveals essence. So we've got to show ourselves forth in authentic action. That's not lazy action. It's not going through the motions action. It's not fake action. It's authentic action. And at that level of, of, of creation, we're going to see what that authentic action is. That's, of course, perfected by grace. So fulfillment stories are about authentic action. And here's what they are. You're going to learn more about these from your mentors, but it's basically this. Fulfillment stories are about, about activities a person has deeply enjoyed doing and believed they've done well. Simply that. Stories when they've been in the zone, been in the flow. Or my uh, friend Ron McNamara, who married a Spanish woman, says there's a phrase like this in Spanish called being in your salsa. Right? Being in your flow. So this is authentic action where our capacities are fully engaged. We kind of forget ourselves. Right? We're deeply engaged. We love it. We lose track of time. Now, these are not stories, and you've got to get this. These are not necessarily stories about contemporary success or achievement in the contemporary way that we sometimes think about achievement. It doesn't have to be about gold stars and meeting sales quotas and having a 4.0. Sometimes it is about that stuff, but it doesn't have to be. Okay? After the Incarnation, says my very favorite poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, after the Incarnation, nothing is trivial. Nothing is trivial. Our Lord came and walked among us for 30 years, made cabinets and shelves with his Father. Nothing's trivial. All is permeated and charged with the grandeur of God, says Hopkins. So these stories are about all kinds of human activity. Baking pies with Grandma when we're 12 years old. Running. Maybe winning races. Making friends. Mediating. Writing stories. Doing spiritual direction. Right? So it can come from any sphere of activity or any age. Any sphere of life or, or kind of activity. Now, you might be thinking at this moment about what your fulfillment stories might be. Rest assured, you've got them, and a lot of them. I've been doing this work for 30 years, actually. I graduated in high school in 1990, and I felt this call to, to do this work from my grandfather and my father. And I've just always loved stories of persons. And I've never had a situation in 30 years where I've not been able to help a person identify stories of fulfillment. You're alive. You have the heartbeat of action. You got these stories. And your mentors are going to help you pull them out. So there's all kinds of valuable stories that we can tell to one another and we ought to tell to one another. Stories of conversion, of course. Stories of meeting profound friends. Stories of our alma mater. Stories of our family. Stories of our family of origin. Stories of the places where we're from. If I'm from Texas, I'll probably tell you about Texas, right? <laughs> right? So there's a lot of different kinds of valuable stories that ought to be part of the story of our life. And we're going to tell those stories to our mentors. We ought to. But these fulfillment stories are especially powerful for revealing the unique aspect of your creation, who you are uniquely created to be. And so your mentors are going to be guiding you through a process of identifying a few of these fulfillment stories, asking you to share them, and listening to you share them with deep, deep empathy. There's a lot of fruit that you can experience from this engagement with your mentors as they draw out your fulfillment stories. Building trust, building rapport is a very significant one. Because it's interesting, even though we talk a lot about who we are as we meet new people. Seldom, in my experience, do we spend a lot of time reflecting upon or sharing these simple stories of deep 
fulfilling activity. I don't know why that is. But it's true that, that we don't often do this. So when we do so, we're gaining insight into the unique gifts, the unique creative impulse, the unique way of being that we are. And so your mentors are going to be able to see that, and you're going to see it too as well. You're going to gain more and more awareness of who you are uniquely created to be, and that's critical for receiving the gift that you are. So I want to close here in just a minute so we've got time for questions. But there's this beautiful connection between your stories of fulfillment and your personal vocation. Because God created you uniquely, he delights when you live that, when you express that in simple ways. Right, so I've got six kids. All of them, they even moved in the womb differently, believe it or not. Fascinating. My wife shares these stories. It's, it's very fascinating. But when, the, when our, each child came forth into the world, they just had a love for being a unique sort of being that they were before they were even conscious. They wanted to be the unique being that they were because God delights in that. He delights in the simple joy of being fulfilled according to how he made us. So these stories of fulfillment are going to give you a snapshot of you living your personal vocation. And in almost every case, they also show the sort of good and the kind of contribution that you've been created to make also. So when you're trying to figure out life and make sure your action plans are, are going to be as robust as possible, you're going to get these snapshots. Oh, wow. I felt fully alive. I felt fully myself there. Particularly when you're living those fulfillment stories clearly bathed in grace. Those are those, are those wow moments that I was living my personal vocation in a very sweet, powerful way there. And that gives you a significant clue about how you can live it in the future as well. Because your unique soul can develop and become more holy, but God's not going to, you're not a blank slate, and you never were. He works within the grains of the created being that you are. I want to close with a quote from Gerard Manley Hopkins. So we've got plenty of time for questions. He says, all things, therefore, are charged with love, are charged with God. And if we know how to touch them, give off sparks and take fire, yield drops and flow, ring and tell of him. And as your mentors draw these stories of fulfillment, you're going to get a glimpse, and they're going to get a glimpse of the kind of fire that you have been given to yield to the world the kind of unique glory that you have been created to shine forth in, and the kind of story that you've been given to share with the world as well. And in doing so, to help build up God's kingdom for all eternity. So I'm open for questions now. Thank you so much for that. I loved especially the Joan of Arc quote, right? We are all drums on which God is beating out his message. And you're a great drum, so where'd it go? <laughs> we heard that. So, all right. So our first question that we have from the audience is, how do you plan responsibly for your future while committing to live in the now? There's a lot of answers to that, I think, but here's one. Living in the now fully, I think, involves this. It involves asking this question and answering it. What are my responsibilities right now? To whom am I responsibility? What are my duties? Right, so I'm a father. I'm a husband. I've got professional responsibilities. And I know what those are. So I need to attend to those. And when I attend to those in the now, I'm also planning. I'm thinking about the future as well. So living present in the now, it doesn't mean forgetfulness of responsibility. I think rather it means identifying those and living them fully. 
So that's, that's one response. There's probably a lot more, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> Great, thank you. The next question is, would you be able to give some more examples of fulfillment stories, perhaps one that doesn't seem like a success? Yes. Not that that happens to any of us, but so just... I've got this wonderful story, and it, 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 it's so moving to me. So I was working with a focus missionary once, who was, you know, he was a leader of a campus. He had four or five people you know, working, working under him, and a lot of professional success as a focus missionary. So I was taking him through this exercise of identifying themes of motivation in his narrative, and this was one of his fulfillment stories. Taking my family to Mass on a very, very snowy Christmas Eve in our large GMC Yukon. He said, it was snowing, a little scary. Picked my daughters up, wrapped them in my coat, brought them to the GMC Yukon, put them into the Yukon, carefully drove to Mass, worshiped with them at Mass. Snowing's really coming down wrapped them up in my coat, brought them to the Yukon, put them in. My daughter, as I strapped her into her car seat, looked at me with great joy and gratitude. That was his fulfillment story. Taking his kids to Mass, right? Because he was, he was, he was living his St. Joseph fatherhood at that time. And it was just so sweet. And he was involved, it wasn't a passive exercise. He's driving very carefully right? and attending to his family. So that would be one, right? Great, thank but you. Also there's this, there's, there's literally there's, there's bacon pies with grandma, there's um, building relationships, there's making people feel welcome. It's, it's all those things that we can think of are mundane but oftentimes are full of God's glory. The next question um, has to do with suffering and how we can kind of integrate that into our personal vocation. So part of living in the present moment is of course receiving the suffering that we are given. And we can receive the suffering that we are given, I think, First of all, by recognizing that, that God allows it and that it's for us particularly. So living fully in the present moment is, is, is how we accept our suffering and everything else. But there's also this. These stories of fulfillment reveal a picture of our unique gifts and a pattern of uniqueness. And what's really interesting, I think, it's a number of interesting things, but we're going to suffer uniquely. So all of us suffer differently. Of course, there's universal suffering that we can look at. There's loss of loved ones. And those who've lost loved ones have a deep sympathy and empathy with others who've lost loved ones. But because of how God created us, we will suffer uniquely. And part of the value of understanding our unique design that's revealed through fulfillment stories is to recognize the way that we're going to uniquely live into the world at every moment. And that also involves how I'm going to squarely face the suffering that I've been given. Right? Does that make sense? Right? We, we, we have to squarely face the suffering that we're given as the unique person that I'm created to be. There's also this, one more point. We can also suffer deeply in the context of, of, of living our gifts and trying to give our gifts, right? So for me, day-to-day -day suffering very much involves who I'm called to be, and it involves the exercise of my gifts, so they're fulfilling in a lot of ways, but they can also be a great cross. <laughs> so, those are some answers to that question. Great. Our next question is, how often should we be reviewing our life in order to find these fulfillment stories, um, especially kind of as our gifts are revealed to us over our life and over time? Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's really important at pivot points. It's really important at pivot points to take close stock of, of who our unique gifts are, or what our unique gifts are, rather. Uh, and those fulfillment stories, they do provide this consistent pattern. It's quite beautiful. Um, so when, when we're trying to discern major directions in life, we just necessarily ask ourselves, all right, Lord, uh, what are these unique gifts that you've been given, that you've given to me, and what are the sorts of needs in the world that they are ordered to fulfill? And so taking really good stock of, of who I am in those fulfillment stories helps us to answer those questions. What are my gifts and what are the needs that they are oriented towards fulfilling? But there's also this. They also show a kind of trajectory. So even, even though they show a unique pattern of gifts, oftentimes those fulfillment stories also show the specific sorts of people and the specific circumstances that I'm also called to work within. And of course, God can throw curveballs. He does, right? He's a God of surprises. But also, as, as Father Scanlon teaches, you know, Father Scanlon was the, uh, the president of, of uh, Franciscan University, he wrote a great book called What Does God Want? One of the principles of discernment that he lays out there is, is that God tends to speak to us consistently. Right? And so we can look at those stories of fulfillment as, as a way that God has consistently worked with me in the past. And so that also helps to see a potential trajectory of, of my future, even though God's going to sometimes throw curveballs, and we've got to be aware of that. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, for the answers to these questions. And I know this is just a quick taste, really, of something you've given your life to. But just so that you know, he has partnered with Given over the past weeks and months and has been working with the mentors and preparing them with his organization, Inscape Vocation. So your mentors have been trained in this much longer than 45 minutes and are really able to um, assist you during these next days and during the next year. So you will be receiving more assistance as you walk through this next year. But again, if we could just thank Josh one more time for his time. Okay, one more thing. Thank you very much. It's a delight being with you. I want to say one more thing. Um, the mentors that you all have been given to work with are full of the love of the Holy Spirit. And I've never, I've never worked with a group of people where I had such a consistent sense of the unity of the Holy Spirit and this eagerness to love and serve, as I have with this group of mentors. And even though it was on Zoom, <laughs> right? I was taking notes on the stuff that they were saying as I was going through uh, the work with them. So um, you're, you're truly blessed with a great group of mentors, and it's been a great privilege to work with them and with Given as well. So thanks for the opportunity. Okay.